Church, let's open our Bibles together for a few moments. If you would, uh, we'll do a little Bible drill here. The book is Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Chapter 6 and verse 4 is where we'll start. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. You don't need to get your bulletin out because today's outline is going to be so simple that you'll walk out of here remembering it, okay? In just 10 or 15 minutes, you're going to know it. Uh, and you'll walk out of here with it in your heart. That's the goal. Let's see what happens, all right? Some of you may have noticed in the news this week that a, an evangelist uh, named Greg Laurie uh, had planned a meeting this weekend in California, and as part of the preparations, they made promotions on billboards in uh, California. The billboards had a picture of Greg Laurie preaching and holding up his Bible, uh, some of you may remember that uh, Billy Graham used to do that when he was preaching. He would hold up his Bible. Surely he's not the only one, but uh, he would do that. He's well known. And Greg Laurie had a picture of himself doing that on this billboard and then other data about the meetings. Well, they put the billboards up in, in a shopping mall and people began to call in because they were offended by the billboard. Now, if you look at the picture, you can go on the internet later and do this. If you look at the picture, you really can't tell what, what's going on. It's just a guy standing there holding a book up. You don't even really know that it's a Bible. It doesn't say Holy Bible on it. There's no cross on it. It just looks like a black book. Uh, but surely, after reading the, the ad, you would realize, okay, there's a, that's a preacher. He's holding a book up. But they were offended by it. Now, those of you that have been watching the news aren't really surprised by that. You're like me. You're disappointed, but not surprised. We're not surprised because this is just something that is happening more and more often. Just another, uh, another example to add to the list of a culture that is uh, more and more uh, impatient, hostile, and tolerant toward Christians, the Bible, and anything that has to do with the Bible. So how is it that we can be faithful in our generation when our generation is so hostile to our beliefs? How can we pass on the truth of God's Word effectively to these young people and prepare them? If this is the direction things are going in, what will the world be like when they are uh, our age? Uh, if the intolerance just continues on. What can we do to help them be prepared? What can we do to be faithful? Well, let's look in the Word. I think we can uh, make three statements this morning that will be very helpful. They're from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4-9. through 9. Take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commands that I'm giving you today should be on your hearts. Now, the speaker ultimately is God but he is speaking through Moses. Moses is at the end of his ministry. He will soon die and pass on leadership to a younger leader named Joshua. And the people who are listening are preparing to go in and take the promised land. And Moses is giving them a series of farewell addresses in the book of Deuteronomy. And he's preparing them for what is about to happen. And one of the things that he's preparing them for is to live the life of a believer in an unbelieving world. You see, they were going to go into a land where they worshipped idols and did a lot of despicable things, and they were going to have to hold on to their faith in the midst of that pagan, idolatrous, and unbelieving world. He was trying to prepare them to live a believing life in an unbelieving world. That's exactly where we find ourselves today. As believers, we have to learn how to live the life of a believer when we are surrounded by an unbelieving world. And notice where he starts in this verse. He says, listen Israel, listen O people of God, the Lord our God is one God. And you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Not just... Uh, admit that he exists or believe that he's out there somewhere but to have the kind of relationship with him that can be described as love how do we do that well look what he says next these commands what commands is he talking about well in the previous chapter he's just reminded them of the ten commandments 
that they received on, at Mount Sinai. So he's talking about the Ten Commandments, but he's talking about all of the other commands and the applications that go along with those in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and now what he is saying in the book of Deuteronomy. In other words, he's saying all that God says, God's Word, it needs to be on your heart and you need to obey it. That's how we love God. To love God, to say we love God and not to obey His commands is to, is to be schizophrenic. It's to, it's to say one thing and do something else. Because the way that we express our love to God is to obey His commands. That's clear from the Old Testament and the New Testament. To do those, we have to know them. We have to agree with them. We have to be walking in agreement with God, and then we can obey His commands. We, too, live in a world that is full of unbelievers. And if we are going to succeed... If we are going to live a life of belief and be faithful in our generation, which includes, to be faithful in our generation includes to prepare the next generation. Because a generation before us prepared us. Some of you may be saying, well, I don't think I was very prepared. Maybe not. Maybe you didn't get the kind of preparation that some of us got. I did. I got good preparation from the generation before. If you didn't get good preparation from the generation before, then I lament that for you. I'm sorry. But you know better than anyone else how important it is that the next generation does get good uh, preparation because you've seen how hard it is when you don't. So part of being faithful for us is to make sure that we pass the faith on to the next generation. We, church, are in a link. We're a link in a chain that reaches all the way back to Moses, all the way back to Abraham, all the way back to Noah, all of those people that we, that we speak about and read about for generations the truth of God has been passed down from one generation to the next, and it's our turn now. This is our opportunity. This is our only chance. We will either succeed or we will fail. If we fail, someone else will succeed on our behalf because the Word of God is not going anywhere. The Word of God will still be living and active on the face of the earth when Jesus Christ cracks the sky, blows the trumpet, the archangel cries out, and He comes down to take His own. He said, heaven and earth is going to pass away, but my words will never pass away. You want to be part of something that's going to last forever? Then be part of the Word of God. Nothing else can make that guarantee. Nothing else will make that claim. Everything else dies. Everything else ends. Everything else is forgotten. But Jesus said, my words will never pass away. So if you want to do something that has meaning to it and purpose, we start right here. What do we do? If we're going to be faithful in our generation, we need God's Word in our hearts. We need God word, God's Word in our hearts. That's the first thing. Now look back at verse 7. It says, impress them on your children. Them being the words of God, the commands of God. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the way, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, what is he saying when he says, sit at home, walk along the way, lie down and get up? What is he saying? Always, everywhere. There's no place that it is inappropriate to talk about what God's Word. Will there be some people who don't want to hear it? Absolutely. But we can tell them, uh, we can say in our own hearts and nicely say to them that we have a mandate from God to talk about His words. And we have to choose. Are we going to obey men? Or are we going to obey God? Are we going to obey the government? Or are we going to obey the throne that sits in heaven that runs the heavens and the earth? So we need God's Word in our hearts, but we also need it in our homes. Let me give you a practical way of how you can talk about God's Word in your homes. I know you're going to watch TV, you're going to play games, you're going to get on the internet. We are going to interact with the culture around us. That's just who we are. I'm not even sure if it would be healthy if we completely walled ourselves off from culture. We would have no connection. We would have no ability to develop relationships with others and share Jesus with them. We have to be careful what we let in, but we will interact with culture. We will watch some TV and do these other things. One of the ways that we can talk about God's Word in our home is to talk about the things that we see on television, especially if you have children in your home, to talk about whether those things that you're watching on television measure up to God's Word and how they measure up or don't measure up. By doing so, you're training your children to understand we have an unchanging measure and everything we see, everything we hear, everything we do is measured by God's Word, even what we watch on television. Now, I'm telling you this, if you do that, 
which we've done in my home, one of the things that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to turn a lot of shows off. Because a lot of shows you're going to say, that's over the top. It doesn't measure up. In fact, it's, it's less than does it me- doesn't measure up. It, it is going against God's Word, and we're not going to listen to that. We're not going to watch it. So that's just one practical way to talk about God's Word in your home. Let me back up for just a moment. There's one, another thing that I should have said about getting it into your heart, and you know what I'm going to say. What is it? No, I, I wish more of you would have said it, but some of you did. And I know what you, a lot of you are thinking, well, I'll just forget it, and what am I going to say? Memorize it anyway. Memorize it, forget it. Memorize it, forget it. Memorize it, forget it. And repeat until you die. Okay? Just keep doing it. Forgetting it is no excuse. God knows you're going to forget it. Uh, but he knows you need it in your heart. So like we, need, we need God's Word. If we're going to be faithful in our generation, we need God's Word in our hearts. We need God's Word in our homes. Have you got that? Let's say it together. We need God's Word in our hearts. Say it. And we need God's Word in our homes. See, I told you, you've got, you've got two-thirds of it. We just need one other piece. All right? Look what he says next in verse 8. Tie them on your hands as symbols. Bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now he's talking about taking God's Word out into the public world, out into the marketplace, especially that last one, the gate, the city gate in the ancient Near Eastern city was a lot like the courthouse downtown. That's where, that's where the, the elders gathered and that's where they made, uh, uh, they made transactions, property transactions, and where they were recorded and where people saw them. That's where legal action was taken a lot of times. That was the happening spot, the gate. That was the, the courthouse. And he's saying, we need it. We need God's Word in our courthouse, in our public square. Did you see uh, this week there's another one of those battles raging over the Ten Commandments on public property. And it's right here in our backyard in Little Rock. Uh, Ten Commandments were put up on the, uh, the grounds in Little Rock, and immediately somebody did what? Do you remember? They drove a car into it and smashed it into a million pieces, so they put it back up. So now what they're going to do is a satanic group wants to come and put this demonic-looking uh, statue next to it, claiming freedom of speech. I believe in freedom of speech. I also believe that this is a sign that our culture is in a very bad place. A very Because... 50 years ago, 100 years ago, you could put the Ten Commandments up in front of a courthouse and nobody would show up wanting to put a demon next to it. All right? So some people think they need to fight that battle politically. That's okay. They, they need to do what they believe is right in God's eyes. But let me tell you something. The battle is lost politically. When people are putting demons up in front of our courthouses, something's already gone deadly wrong in our culture. And it's not going to be solved in the courthouse. It's going to be solved in the church. It's going to be solved in our hearts, and it's going to be solved with the Word of God because we need the Word of God in our hearts, in our homes, and we need it in our communities. And we're not going to get it into our communities by passing a law. We're going to get it into our communities by passing it along to somebody else's heart. So let's say those three things together. If we're going to be faithful in our generation, we need God's Word in our hearts. Say that. We. Now, I hope you believe that. I want you to say it like you believe it, all right? What's the second one? We in our homes. And what's the last one? We in our communities. We need it in our hearts, our homes, and our communities. Now, the order is, is not by accident. We can't start out by putting God's Word in our community and hope that it'll dribble back down into our hearts. That's my problem with approaching this thing politically. It's backwards. This thing needs to be approached spiritually. The power is in the Word, but the power's not there if the Word's not there. If I go out to fight the battle and I don't have the Word in my heart, then I'm going to fail. If I go out to fight the battle and the Word's not in my home, then I don't have a platform to work from, and and the demon is going to end up on the courthouse lawn. And that's where we are. We need God's Word in our hearts first. Then we need it in our homes, and we need it in our communities. Karen and I were watching a special this week uh, on uh, the Voyager uh, program. Some of you remember this 1977, two space probes were sent out, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, to take pictures of the planets in our solar system and whatever else could be found out there. And we've been getting pictures, we as a culture have been getting pictures back from those things for years now. They're still out there 
uh, rushing away uh, from, from the sun. And some of the pictures that have been sent back are absolutely astounding uh, of God's handiwork uh, in our solar system. And one of the most uh, dramatic pictures that uh, was ever sent back was when the probe was 3.7 billion miles away from Earth. Whew. Wow. You have to stop and gas up the car a few times to get that far out. 3.7 billion miles. Somebody had the bright idea that said, hey, let's turn the camera around and point it back at Earth and take a picture of the Earth. So they did. You can go on the internet and look this picture up. It's absolutely amazing. What you see when you see this picture is the dark background of space, and you see these shafts of light with kind of unusual coloring, pastelish almost. One of them is brownish, brownish, pinkish. And at first, that's all that you see in this picture is just these shafts of light which are coming from the sun in the dark black background of space. But if you continue to look at the shaft on the far right, and you continue to look about halfway down, something catches your attention, and you look closer, and it looks like at first that there's just a mistake in the picture, like maybe somebody punctured it and there's a hole. But as you look closer, you realize there's a little bluish dot, and I mean dot, it's tiny. And that little bluish dot is the planet that we're on right now, Earth. It's really an amazing picture. You know, and Carl Sagan was alive at this time. Some of you may remember him. Billions and billions, if you ever watched his shows. Carl Sagan's shows were worship services for the universe. They worshipped the universe. Carl would say, all, the universe is all there ever was, all there is, and all there will ever be. That's a very studied statement. He's ripping off God because the Bible says that God is the one who was and who is and who is to come. He knew what he was saying. When Carl saw this little dot uh, in that shaft of light almost four billion miles away and how tiny it was, he made a statement publicly. He said, how can we possibly look at this little planet that we're on and see how small and insignificant it is and think that somehow or another that we occupy a privileged space in the universe. It's a delusion, he said. It's a delusion to think that we occupy a position of privilege in space. That statement is a direct challenge to all religion and belief in God. But here's the thing. Since Carl died for years and years now, science has spent billions of dollars to try to find what? You know what they do now, don't you? We went to the moon, we got that out of the way, we sent space shuttles, we needed something to do, we needed something to keep our budgets going, and here's what they do. This is what our money is being spent on. And you need to know it because it's your money. The space program today is about one thing. It's about finding a space alien. Finding a space alien. And they're not going to give up until they find that space alien. And here's the thing. Have they found him? They're not going to. And every year that goes by and they don't find a space alien, Carl Sagan's statement gets turned on its head. Because there is no place in this vast universe, in our solar system, that's 92 million miles around, 92 billion miles around, in our galaxy that's so big that I can't even understand it, that's one of so many galaxies that I can't even understand that in this universe that we're in. And so far, the evidence is that only here is there intelligent life. Do we occupy a privileged space in the universe? Absolutely we do. This is it. This is where God put people who are made in His image. And we have a message of hope. Here's the thing that got me. These scientists that they were uh, interviewing who were part of this program back in the 70s and early 80s, they were all a little bit older now, and they spoke about the program in hushed, reverence tones as they thought about the worship that they give, not to God, but to God's creation. And here's the thing that really caught my attention. They said that when we find the space alien, that we will find the meaning and purpose of our lives. You think I'm kidding. Look it up on Netflix and watch it. That to find meaning and purpose in our lives, 
we must find a space alien. Now, I don't know why that would give us the meaning and the purpose of our lives. But brothers and sisters in Christ, you have the meaning and the purpose of life right there in your hand right now. It's the Word of God. And it needs to be in your heart, our hearts. It needs to be in our homes. And it needs to be in our communities. Because our communities are hearing this message from Carl Sagan and others who say that the meaning and the purpose of life is going to be found from space aliens. It's not. It's found from God. From God. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? So you remember the outline from this morning. We'll walk out of here with it. To be faithful in our generation, I've got to have God's Word in my heart. I've got to have it in my home. I've got to have it in my communities. How are you doing on that? Is God's Word in your heart? Let me, let me just make a plug for Sunday school here. That's a good place to really work God's Word into your heart and your life and learn more about how, how to have it in your home. Sunday school. Be in Sunday school. In your homes, talk about it. Talk about it with your kids. Whether you have kids or not, but especially if you have children in your home, you need to be talking about God's Word. Teach them how to measure life by God's words. In our communities, well, I don't think we're going to solve the problem in our communities by passing laws. We need to pass on God's words. Who do you know right now that you believe is lost? Who do you know right now? Somebody you work with, somebody you live next door to, somebody you go to class with. Maybe it's a family member that you see from time to time. They live nearby. Who do you know right now that you believe is lost? Who do you know right now that is Whether they're lost or not, they're not in church. If they're saved, something went wrong along the way and and they're not not worshiping, they're not serving. Who do you know? You have a name? At least one name in your mind right now? Many of you are reading books, these little books by Tom Rainer, I Will, Who Moved My Pulpit, I'm a Church Member, etc. He's got a bunch of them. He's very insightful. Tom Rainer recently said this. He said, in our churches today, only 2% of the people in our churches invite somebody else to church. Only 2%. I hope it's higher here at Grace, but he said generally it's it's only 2%. I want to challenge you this morning. We've got Flip Sunday coming up. You got that name still there in front of you? That name of somebody that you believe is lost, not in church? Flip Sunday's coming up, third Sunday in September. That's a Sunday where we really try hard to invite people to church. Would you start praying for that name or those names that God just put on your heart. And you look for the opportunity to invite them to come and be a part of what's happening here on Flip Sunday. Maybe even have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. But I'm asking you this morning to be part of that 2% who will reach out and let's turn this thing around that's going on in our culture because it's not good. This is the only way we're going to do it. We're not going to do it by passing laws. We're going to have to pass on the word of God and we're the ones who are going to have to do it. Would you? Would you please? If you're here this morning and you've never publicly confessed faith in Jesus, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. May I ask you, do you believe with your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead? You know He died for your sins. You need to be forgiven. And you know that God raised Him up again so He can be Lord of your life. Do you believe that? That's the first step. Here's the next step. Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. You've got to go public. Have you ever confessed with your mouth Jesus is Lord and been baptized? Believer's baptism. If not, and you need to, we're going to have an invitation. I invite you to come up and say, hey, I'm ready to do that. I'm ready to step over the line. I want to be part of what's going on in God's kingdom. We will pray with you, help you make that next step. If you need to join the church, you need to be baptized, or just need to come to the altar and get on your knees, This is the time we do that. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, God. Impress it upon our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.